Hi everybody, I'm Susie Orman. And what you are about to see are interviews with women who have survived abusive relationships. They are intimate, they are personal, and they are life transforming. Watch and learn. So Vicki May, I just have to ask you this. You are 44 years of age and you spent more than half of your life living in a situation where it was an abusive situation. You got to tell me about this. Well, it started when I was very young. I was 17 and a friend put it to me this way. He picked you before you bloomed. And um, in the beginning, the relationship was clouded in secrecy right from the jump because he was married. Absolutely. What did you find attractive about him? He lavished lifestyle on me. So here's what I find interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Almost every woman that I've interviewed about this topic, it all starts with a man or a woman, it doesn't matter who you are, but the person lavishing a lifestyle, giving them a diamond ring, giving them this. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that's common? Um, I do, I do. It's really, it's a great sales tactic. <laughs> um, you know, come along with me and I, I have heard other women speak on the subject as well. Come here and I'm gonna show you different. I'm gonna show you something new. He's eight years older than me. Uh -huh. um, and it was, really the first man to take interest in me. He made me feel special and wanted and loved, so long as I did exactly the way, things the way he wanted. I was really running from my identity at the time, and I was looking for a daddy, and I found one. And when he asked you to do things a specific way, did that go against your grain, or were you like, okay, not a big deal, it wasn't, it didn't really matter. All right, he wanted it, I'll do it. Right, right. If towels needed to be folded a certain way or something needed to be done a certain way, okay, I can yield to that. That's not, I don't have to be picky. If that's the way you want it, fine with me. And how many kids do you have? Um, actually, I don't have any kids. I've never been pregnant. That was another, um, I wasn't allowed to consider getting pregnant. Um, he didn't, he had kids from his first marriage and he didn't want to have any more. And those kids didn't live with you? Oh, no. Because what's interesting is that when women are also wives, are also mothers, yes. when makes them normally leave is when the kids are in danger. Right, so, yes, so I did have children in my life. Um, I have my niece and my nephew, um, and we got them when they were six and three. They're 18 and 15 now. And um, that, that very much had a lot to do with my leaving when I did. Because? Because I could no longer tolerate trying to shield and guard and protect them. From the day we brought them home, I was always running interference to keep the first baby in the, in the house happy and literally basically abandoning them in my own home. To, to be on their own. They were fed and clothed and, you know, taken to school and had the best that money could buy, but there was no, I wasn't allowed to foster um, a closeness with them. So he literally made it, as many abusers do, that you were in his little shell. Yes. And you had no outside touch points. They were pawns. He used to joke. He would say, to train up a woman properly, you have to cull her away from her mother. You have to get her away from her family and her friends. And that's exactly what he did. What made you stay for 26 years? 26 years. Yeah. It's a great question. And my answer to that question is I stayed first because I didn't know it was abuse. But Vicki Mae, if you didn't think it was abuse, mm -hmm. what did you think it was? Mm, I thought I was being a good wife. I wanted to, and I was a good wife. I wanted to support and encourage and inspire and love and uh, and I did those things. Besides it just being verbal abuse and him being controlling, mm -hmm. was there physical abuse? No, physical abuse was not his MO, but there's emotional abuse, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, um, financial abuse. Tell me about the abuse. 
So I worked for him. It was a small um, family owned business and I was always an employee first. But there, he, there came a point where he wouldn't work. And I would, I would go to him and I would say, one of us has to get a job. And so then he, he would get up and go get some money from somewhere and come back with it. And um, I was just not, it wasn't permitted for me to go get a job outside of what we were doing. So did you have to ask him for money when I you wanted money? I had to beg him and beg him and plead with him. I had kind of gotten fed up with this whole not having any money business and him not being you know, willing to get up and go get a job or permit me to because I was too busy with him and the kids and the business that we were doing, but we weren't really doing anything. We were in between projects. I am pursuing um, public speaking and have a vision of that for myself. And I went to a conference in Houston called Presentation Power with Jonathan Sprinkles and he allowed three women from the National Domestic Violence Hotline to come and tell their story. And the story that they were telling I always thought domestic violence was someone hitting someone, but these women were telling stories about verbal abuse and bullying and intimidation and really slight innuendo and, and body language. I was that sensitive to it. Um, all of these while I'm dealing with him on the phone. He was texting me, calling me while I'm at the conference, really giving me a hard time because I wasn't there taking care of him. And I was um, observed by someone from the hotline. She saw me, she saw me, she saw what was going on. And she came up to me and asked me if I was okay. And that was how I made my initial contact. Once I heard those women's stories, I was confronted with the truth. When she asked you if you were okay, did you start to cry? I did. Right away, I did, right? I was already crying and I was hiding in the hallway um, oh. because I, I didn't want anyone to see me crying. And, um, and was that the first time you had ever cried about this? Oh. Like, had you ever, you had shed tears about it oh, before? Oh, yes, and then I would be made fun of. Oh, are you going to cry now? And when you would cry on your own, mm -hmm. what made you cry then? I think it was just this feeling of not being good enough, no matter what I did. And he would say those things to you? Yes, it would be, he would be disappointed. He wouldn't be happy. It took me some time to accept the truth that the relationship was abusive. Why do you think that happens? Why um, do you think, I think goes on? Mm -hmm. I think women in general are so, if you don't have self-worth or self-confidence, if you don't know you have value, you settle for anything. And there was always this veiled threat that he would leave me and I didn't want to be left. So um, I think I was, I know, I was desperate for love and acceptance. That was it from the jump. So once I realized it was abuse, I had to do something about it. And is that why you also wanted to do this today? Because yes. how about how important it is yes. that women, all of us, because yes. I've suffered abuse, that all of us, not from a relationship, but from my father, mm -hmm. that, that all of us have the ability to talk about that and share that? Yes. I, I have a message and a story and a courage to tell it. It's my duty to share my story and tell my truth so that other women will know. And why, after 26 years, what was the turning point that made you want to get out and that allowed you to get out? Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine said to me, Vicki, you know that verse, that love your neighbor as yourself. You have to first love yourself. And I didn't. And that really opened my eyes to, yes, I do have a voice and I have value and I have worth and I have something to contribute. And when I started asserting that, it was really not met well by him. And um, I just got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. I was, not, I was no longer willing to live in that environment um, given the fact that I was making enough money to support myself and my children. Because to me, that was um, a pathway out because I knew I had to have money. I couldn't get anywhere if I didn't have money. And it was a pathway out of the relationship to yes, save yourself. Yes, to so save yourself. So now myself. you're already thinking about, all right, yes. I need an out. And he told me, he told me, it feels like you're getting your ducks in a row to leave me. And that was like a match stripe for me. And a Tuesday came and I picked the lock on that beautiful cage I was living in and I flew out.
And what allowed you to fly out was mm -hmm. that you had the money yes. to fly out. Yes, but a week after I moved out, he went and withdrew all the funds from the checking account and wouldn't give me any. I had to borrow money from friends and family who were still there for me, even after all that time when I wasn't there for them. You know what's interesting is that I've been with KT, the love of my life, now for 18 years. Congratulations. Thank you. But, and I love her and I adore her more than life itself. And we don't have a joint checking account. I wouldn't have a joint checking account with anybody ever. Yeah. Maybe I would have an account that we would put equal percentages right. in to pay bills, but Help. I would never have a joint checking account and I would never advise women that you combine all your money, it's all in one place. Right. Oh, no, no, no. Right. You enter a relationship, an autonomous woman, yes. woman, and you stay financially autonomous from the day that you you know, get there yeah. until the day that you die. Yes. So that's so important to understand. It's absolutely critical. You must have control over your own money. I do still have to, to have dealings with him. What is holding you to them? Is there money holding you to him? Do you still get money from him? I do. Tell me about I that. I do. So, um, um, and just so you know, together. you yes. were married more than 10 years, so you yes. qualify for half his Social Security. You know what? That's good to know. I'll have to keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, I big will. time, girlfriend. I will. All right. I, I'll just tell, I'll just on a little, I'm not, I'm not going to need his money. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not coming from him. It's coming yeah. from Social Security. That is a legal right that you have, unless, of course, you get remarried or whatever it may be. Right. But at this point, I'm yeah. just telling you, once you're married for 10 years, right. you now, later on in life, qualify for their, their half of their Social Security Thank or you. your own, whichever one is more. Greater, but right. just so you know that. Okay, Thank go you. on. As a result of Texas law, I, through mediation and settling the divorce, I get a monthly payment from him. And of how much? Of $1,000. When you get that check from him, mm -hmm. and you look at that check, mm -hmm. if he even sends it, does yes. he send it? Well, he sends it late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when he sends it. And it's supposed to be set up on direct deposit for this next month. We'll see what happens. But when you when you did see that check mm -hmm. and you saw that $1,000, mm -hmm. what did it make you feel like? It's my money. It's your I worked, money. I worked hard for that money. He's not giving me that money. That's, That's my money. I love that. I worked hard for that money, a lot harder than he did. Because I can tell you in his mind, Oh yes. it's his money, yes, and he's tell you using we this money to antagonize you yes. on some level, because oh, that's the only way that exactly. he can get to you. Absolutely, I can tell you exactly how he's trying to antagonize me. How? He writes little messages in the memo, still asking. Now here's what's important from me to you. The money that he's putting into that account, he knows your account number, mm -hmm. he knows everything about it. Okay. You should not keep any more than that $1,000 that he puts in there. That should be it. Okay. And the second it goes in there, you should Sorry. withdraw it and okay. put it into another account that he has no idea. You do not want okay. him to know where your money is, anything. Because trust me, yes, he can find a way to get that money if he wanted to. Yes, I know. So just, can you promise me you'll get it I out promise. of there? I promise. I pinky promise. You do. Come pick. There you know go. you can't break it, Pinky you promise. Can, no, you cannot. <laughs> right. And so here you are. Yes. Your future is in front of you. Yes. Tell me one last thing that you want everybody to know. If I can, you can. You got it, Vicki Mae. And guess what? Yeah. We can. Yes, there we you can. Go. Thank you. Thank you so much.